So 2020 has been a rather strange year, and Record Store Day certainly reflected that this year, but I got a lot of great metal and rock and soundtrack albums, both US and UK titles, so I'm going to be going through those, as well as talking about RSD 2020 in general. So stick around, it's going to be a good time. So we had Record Store Day. Well, sort of Record Store Day. Uh, as we know, COVID happened this year, and that put a bit of a damper on things. So the original April event uh, got canceled, actually got pushed to June 1st, and then got canceled. Um, it was replaced, or reimagined, if you will, with three events that happened at the end of August, the end of September, and the end of October. Uh, basically, the list from April got split up into three different days at the ends of each of those months. And then, of course, we had Black Friday. So there were four events instead of two. And there were a lot of rules and restrictions that each record store had to go through. Again, dealing with COVID that might have took some of the fun out of it. Not all, but some of it, for sure. So given the COVID restrictions, a lot of record stores had to get rather inventive uh, regarding social distancing and all the other stuff, uh, whether or not you believe in it, you know, whatever. Uh, Pure Pop Records here in Burlington, Vermont was the store I went to. They were participating in Record Store Day when at least one other store in town did not, uh, which I respect, I guess. Um, here's how they did it, basically. Up until 7.30 a.m., uh, people could show up at the front door, not going inside, and Mikey, uh, the, the metal guy at Pure Pop Records, uh, he would have a bunch of pieces of paper with numbers on them. And you would get a number, and you would either sit in your car or go home until 8 o'clock. Uh, between that time period, Pure Pop would post all of those numbers on their website. And whatever order they drew them in was the order you would come in. And everyone would get four minutes and a time slot. So in one case, actually, I got chosen first, even though I had number six. Uh, the numbers themselves didn't matter about the order. It was just how they, they were chosen. So I got to go in at 8 o'clock sharp, and I had first pick. It was really great, so I was pretty excited about that. But And that's how they did it, you know. They would have people come in in four-minute intervals, and then I think at 11 o'clock, they would open the store to the general public. So that's how they did it. Maybe your record store in town did it a little differently. You should let me know in the comments how things went for you. Love to hear about that for sure. So it wasn't all bad, because I did get some really great records. I'm going to talk about those shortly. But I do have a couple gripes concerning the releases. Uh, the first of which was with Ace Fraley's Trouble Walking reissue, which basically was just trouble, period. A lot of people got two copies of record one, or two copies of record two, instead of one of each, like you should, which is a major screw-up. I don't know how that even happened. Also, uh, Judas Priest's British Steel reissue uh, was supposed to come out on red, white, and blue vinyl, as the Record Store Day website said. Instead came out as a picture disc, which is radically different. And I'm not really interested much in picture discs these days, so I basically passed on it. And I, I don't know what happened there. And I'm going to talk about one more of these towards the end, because my final record has a similar story in that regard. Uh, stay tuned for that. But yeah, those are my only gripes, though, really. So overall, I'd like to see less of the straight reissues. You know, the same record repressed over and over again in different colors of vinyl. That's fine, but I'd rather see more exclusive releases, ones that have maybe bonus tracks or special inclusions, new packaging, something that makes it worth not only buying, but if you have the old one, maybe rebuying. I don't know why the labels aren't thinking in these terms. They should, because they would sell more records, and we'd love it more. So. Just a thought. So other than that, I had a really good time, as I always do with Record Store Day, regardless of the restrictions. So I got myself a lot of US titles, but I did get some UK releases too that were UK only for Record Store Day. And I have at least one record in here that started as a Record Store Day record, but then dropped off the list after the restrictions and the cancellations happened. So we'll be talking about that one shortly. It's kind of interesting, but that's what I got. So let's get to all of the Record Store Day releases that I bought in 2020. So starting things off with Goblin, this is their Greatest Hits album, 1975 to 1979. Uh, Goblin is a prog rock band. Uh, you might know them best as scoring some great Italian horror movies in the 1970s, uh, mostly for Dario Argento. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Uh, this is the record, by the way, that was originally on the RSD list and then got dropped or got pulled 
take your pick. Uh, there's a company in Italy called Cinevox Records. They're the ones that put this out. And they must have just decided that, well, put it out anyways. We already made them. But they didn't want to deal with Record Store Day, I guess, for some reason. So, um, Also, I do have the hype sticker that has Record Store Day mentioned, which is kind of funny. I did find this in a store. Uh, after the fact. I was pretty excited because I thought that ac the actual record was just not going to make it out at all. And I was kind of sad about that, but there it was in a store. I'm like, okay, I will buy it now. So, there you go. So this title was limited to 1,500 copies total, uh, 750 in the United States, and it was also a regional release, so depending on where you are is how you got it. Um, yeah. Also, it is available on red vinyl. I believe that is the only variant for it. There's custom labels that match the jacket. Also want to give you a shot of the gatefold. A lot of great things here. There's the uh, releases of the various Goblin soundtracks. Uh, liner notes are kind of fun. It starts with, you wanted the best, you got the best. The weirdest prog band in the world, Goblin. Which of course is a playoff off of Kiss intro to their live shows. Uh, yeah, great stuff. Love it. As for tracks, there is a never-before-released edited version of Roller. comes from the movie Vampire. Also, I should go through some of my favorites here. Uh, Profundo Rosso and Death Dies, both from Deep Red. Or Profundo Rosso, if you prefer. As well as the title track to Suspiria. Speaking of Suspiria and Deep Red, rest in peace, Daria Nicolodi. Uh, she was responsible for some of the screenwriting, but she was also in a number of Dario Argento's films. Uh, she was also in his life. They had a romantic relationship together. Uh, they had a daughter together, Asia Argento, who was in many of her father's films later on. So, yeah, I think this record's going to remind me a little bit of Miss Nickelodeon, at least for the foreseeable future. Yeah. So, of course, I'm a big fan of Italian horror movies from the 1970s. Argento is definitely on the top of that list for me. And so it's really great to have this soundtrack of sorts to a lot of those movies, a compilation soundtrack, if you will. So I'm definitely looking to get more Goblin on vinyl in the future. Moving on to U.S. titles for August. This is Entombed with Clandestine Live. Obviously a live album for the band. Uh, this was originally released last year in 2019 on vinyl. Uh, it came out in dark green but also gold. Uh, this particular issue is in gold as well as has some interesting inclusions which I'll get to shortly. So Clandestine Live was originally released to celebrate the 25th anniversary of its namesake. Uh, that would be their second studio LP, known as Clandestine. Uh, this is actually the Clandestine album played in its entirety live, though there is one track uh, that is from another album of theirs, a rather infamous album, their first one, as a matter of fact, and this, they do the title track to that album, which is Left Hand Path. Ending the show with that is really great, because who doesn't love that album? Uh, those first two Entombed albums are pretty classic as it stands, so it's really nice to have all of this material here in a live setting. Pretty great. So this was a U.S.-only uh, 500 pressed, again, on gold vinyl. There, and much the same there. Also wanted to show you some of the things you get with it inside. They're pretty cool. One is this gigantic poster of clandestine oh kind of gigantic there you go yeah great artwork fantastic pretty sure that's dan seagrave's work and the inner sleeves are pretty great too uh full color and you get some lyrics as well uh very familiar font you might recognize it's kind of their logo in font form for the lyrics pretty cool and yet another one here uh, wh where it was performed and how and all that stuff as well as some more live pictures and some more liner notes for you there yeah they did a nice job on the packaging for this for sure um, there's also a nice gatefold with the live setting and the track listings there yeah so this was released by Three Man Recordings, uh, who have issued or reissued a lot of the Entombed discography, as well as Nihilist. Nihilist, of course, is the precursor band to Entombed. Um, also, not much of a coincidence, considering that Three Man is run by Entombed. Uh, you should definitely check out their website at threeman.net uh, for albums and merch. Uh, a lot of the merch stuff is pretty cool. I would check out that selection of that for sure. 
So my favorite track on here is definitely Chaos Breed. It's one of my favorite in Tomb songs in general, but also Left Hand Path. It's a classic track. Um, the one thing about that last track, though, it it is a bit restrained in its performance. I would have liked a little more energy there, especially as a closer, but I dug it anyways. In fact, I dug this whole album. It's pretty good. So the performance on this overall is pretty top-notch. Uh, the sound is decent, though not perfect, but it is a live and tuned album. I mean, it's pretty spectacular on that level. So I would definitely recommend this if you can get it, and it's out there, so you should be able to. As for UK titles that I picked up in August, this is uh, not only Dracula, but it's also The Curse of Frankenstein. These are two complete scores for the Hammer films of the same title. Uh, Dracula, of course, you might remember if you're an American, that it was actually called The Horror of Dracula. But Brits know it as simply Dracula. Uh, both movies have Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee. Christopher Lee, of course, as the titular character. I love the word titular. Great stuff. Uh, this is numbered. This is 1,000 released. I got number 674 right there. Uh, City of Prague Philharmonic Orchestra did this, uh, conducted by Nick Rain. Uh, this is a modern performance. This isn't an older version. It isn't pulled from the movie directly, for instance. And there were other versions that went back a ways. Uh, there is an early 90s version as well, uh, conducted by another orchestra. But this sounds way better than that. I've been, I, I've been checking out some of the older versions of these soundtracks, and I'd much rather hear this. It's pretty good. So this title was limited to 1,000 copies and is on two different colored vinyl. Uh, the first of which is Blood Red for Dracula, naturally. Love the picture on the back of Christopher Lee there. Fantastic. Also, for Curse of Frankenstein, we, of course, get green. Uh, this is called Cursed Green, and there it is. And great picture of Mr. Cushing there. Also, we have an insert card with uh, uh, write-ups of all of the tracks here, as well as for The Curse of Frankenstein. Great liner notes, uh, fantastic stuff. Also comes in a gatefold jacket with amazing images from these two classic films. I'm a huge Hammer Films fan, so to have this collection is just, man, can't tell you how happy I am. Now, this is the first time that this particular title has been released. Um, I don't think it's going to make it out into a wider release, necessarily. Uh, this is a limited run, so there's that. So, as I mentioned, the sound is a lot better on this than a lot of previous editions, but I think the performance is better as well. I think it's an upgrade on both levels. So, there you go. Moving on to September and U.S. releases. This might look a little familiar to you if you watch my Vinyl Hall show because I'm talking about it yet again. This is Nativity in Black, a tribute to Black Sabbath. This was an RSD exclusive release. So this album originally came out in 1994 in the United States. It was put out on cassette and CD, but it was available on vinyl in Europe and Brazil back then. Uh, this is the first time it's appeared on vinyl in the United States, but also in Canada. It's uh, a North American-only RSD release. I also should mention that that 1994 European version out there has a bonus track. It has Solitude covered by Cathedral. I'd love to snag that one day. So this release was limited to 2,000 copies, even though Discogs says 3,000. They're lying. The vinyl variant came in a clear with heavy black swirl, at least that's what they're calling it. Realistically, it's black smoke. I have a number of favorites on here. I definitely love Sepultura's cover of Symptom of the Universe, probably one of the best ones on here, as well as Typo Negative's version of Black Sabbath. And of course, Typo Negative make Black Sabbath their own. It's very much a typo song um, in that regard. Uh, there are some okay ones on here. I think Paranoid by Megadeth is fine. Um, it is dated a little bit in the 1990s with inclusions by Biohazard. Um, Ozzy Osbourne with Therapy <laughs> is on here as well. Uh, the version of Faith No More is War Pigs, the live version, not a studio one. So if you're looking for that, that's there. Also, Ugly Kid Joe's on here. White Zombie. Uh, interesting, 1000 Homo DJs is on here. That was a project by Al Jorgensen of Ministry. Um, it's funny, he had the project and he brought it to the label. And the label literally said, this sounds like 1000 Homo DJs. And Al went, that's the name of the project. Little story there for you. And Corrosion Conformity's version of Lord of This World is also pretty decent. So it's a solid, if not occasionally dated tribute to the band that invented heavy metal. We all know that. But it does work more often than it does not. So I would definitely recommend it. 
Moving on to September releases for the UK, this is Paradise Lost with their live album entitled Live at Rock Palace 1995. Uh, this one comes in 180 gram white vinyl. Looks like that. And there. Also came with an insert, in case you forgot what the name of the band and the title is, as well as some liner notes and track listings and all of that. This is the first time it was ever released on vinyl, uh, but this did come out last year in 2019 on CD. This vinyl release was limited to 1,500 copies. Uh, mine was numbered 449, Let's see if you can see that there. Pretty cool. The sound on this is decent, though I think Nick is occasionally off-key uh, at times, maybe phoning it in a little bit, but for the most part, a good performance. Uh, it's definitely worth having. The show here is in support of their Draconian Times album, which came out in 1995. Uh, the set list kind of reflects that. The whole first record is pretty much uh, material from there. Uh, the second record has a lot of material from Icon and Shades of God. So if you're into those two albums, it's pretty good. The first two albums aren't reflected here, though. There's no Lost Paradise and there's no Gothic. So if you're fans of those albums, you're not going to get that here. As a big fan of the Shades of God album, I tend to favor that material on here. I love Pity the Sadness, and I love As I Die. That's a classic track from them. But a lot of the Draconian Times material is also pretty fantastic. I dig that you can hear the audience on this, at least a little bit. And I dig that. I think it's missing from a lot of live albums these days. I don't know why that is, but it's on here in case you're looking for that. This is a really decent record. I'm really happy with it. In fact, it has reminded me to check out some of the more mid-career Paradise Lost studio albums, which I'm definitely going to get to. Yeah. Moving on to October U.S. releases, this is Cheap Trick with their live album, Out to Get You, live 1977. Limited to 4,700 copies, which is a lot, comparatively speaking. You should be able to find this in the aftermarket. I like that the title is a sticker. That's interesting. I wonder if the last minute they thought, we should stick the title on this somehow. How did we forget? I don't know, but it's kind of funny. Gives it kind of a bootleggy quality in some regards, so this certainly is not a bootleg. Sounds pretty good. I'm going to go into that later. Vinyl on this one is classic black, but not just that. It also has the classic 70s epic labels on it, which is pretty nice. Nice little detail. If you're a Cheap Trick fan of that material, you recognize that right away. Also comes in a gatefold jacket uh, with liner notes by music journalist Ken Sharp. Ken has done a number of books on music and bands. Uh, he's also done liner notes for a lot of other bands' albums. Uh, Kiss comes to mind, Santana, The Guess Who, many others. Ken Sharp is a known quantity, so it's nice to have his input on this recording. So the album pulls from a total of four shows over two nights. That'd be the 3rd and the 4th of June, 1977, at the Whiskey in Hollywood, California. So it's a club show, which must have been pretty cool to be at. So these tracks were taken from the original 16-track half-inch master tapes from the Sony vaults. Uh, this is also a newly remixed album from those tapes, and previously unreleased material, by the way. Uh, this hasn't been out there until now on this record, so that's really nice. What's nice for me having this collection is that through this record, having also at Budokan, as well as the previous RSD Cheap Trick live album that came out, I now have a great span of live material from this band, from 1977 through 1978 and 1979, which is my favorite era of Cheap Trick, so I'm a pretty happy camper. So great early-ish material for Cheap Trick, also performed at a club, so there's the intimacy of that. Um, yeah, I'm digging this recording. It's pretty good. Also for October releases in the United States, this is Slave to the Grind, the second album for Skid Row. This is a reissue, 2LP set, expanded edition, as they call it. It's also a very glossy cover. Catches the light quite nicely. So 4,000 copies of this record were pressed on red vinyl. Again, the 2LP set. There you go. And there's also an insert with lyrics for both records, right there. Also comes in a gatefold jacket for this expanded edition. Uh, the artwork many people might know is Sebastian Bach's dad. Uh, David Bierk is his name. Uh, prolific artist in his own time, I guess. I did a little bit of research on him. He's, uh, he's a known quantity in the art world to some degree. Um, nice to have his artwork here, of course. And uh, you also get the pictures of the band and some liner notes there. 
So as I mentioned before, this is a two LP set. The second record is bonus tracks. There are four in total. And it's likely that the bonus tracks were pulled from the original Japanese edition of Slave to the Grind. It had these four tracks. I'll assume that's where they come from. So we start with Beggar's Day. Beggar's Day was on the clean version of Slave to the Grind back in 91. It replaced a song called Get the F Out, which was on the dirty version, I guess, if you want to call it that. So you get both of those tracks here. Also, Holiday in the Sun is here. That's a Sex Pistols cover song. And then the album ends with two live tracks. You get Get the F Out, live from Wembley Arena, 1991, as well as a live version of Judas Priest delivering the goods. Uh, that's in Arizona, 1992. Fantastic song, probably one of my favorite songs on Hellbent for Leather or Killing Machine, depending on who you are. Uh, what's cool about this version is that Rob Halford and Judas Priest actually joins the band on stage, and they perform it together. And that was probably possible because Halford lives in Arizona. He lives in Phoenix. So maybe that's how that all hooked up. But anyways, very cool end of this album. So excited to have this on vinyl. I think Skid Row is a great band. They put out a great debut record. They put out an even more kick-ass second album. I mean, they beat the sophomore jinx at a lot of levels. This is way heavier than that first record. It just has so much punch and delivery. I love it. Anyways, Slave to the Grind. Rounding off October U.S. releases, this is Judas Priest with the reissue of their second album entitled Sad Wings of Destiny. This is an RSD first release title, so you'll see it out there later, of course. 2,700 copies total put out. And I do want to talk about the packaging in this deluxe edition because it's pretty amazing. Uh, there is some uh, embossing going on here. It's rays and the wings. I don't know if you can really see that very well, like in the logo there as well. The title is in black, but it's raised, and you see a lot of that on the back cover as well up here. And in the track listing, you have to really tilt it to find those tracks because they're black on black as well. Also comes in a gatefold jacket. Um, I'm a little underwhelmed by the art here. I, they could have done a little bit more with this. I like the photographs. They are also kind of glossy. I don't know if you can see that. That's kind of interesting. But, you know, it'll do. So there's a two LP set. It spins at 45 RPMs. Here's the vinyl. It is black in blue. Not black and blue. Doesn't want to beat you up. But pretty decent. Um, I really am not a fan of pushing one album to two records. They're doing that to make more money, and that's why they put it in 45. They, you know, I'm not going to say Judas Priest. It's a, E1 put this record out, so they're likely the culprits, but I'm kind of tired of it. I don't want to flip records three times when it could just be one. And I know the argument, it sounds better when you master it at 45. Whatever. So I'm guessing that so much attention was paid to the outside packaging of this that no one cared about the inside very much. Uh, there's no insert. There are no liner notes, realistically. I would have liked that. Maybe Halford could have written something up, or maybe it could have rounded up Alan Moore. He was the original drummer on this. I don't know. Someone. You know. But the labels do what they do. Regardless, this is a great addition, and it fills that hole in my 70s Judas Priest vinyl collection. So, very happy. Moving on to Black Friday releases for the United States, this is Buck Cherry with their self-titled debut album from 1999. Obviously, this is a reissue. This is also an RSD first release. You'll probably see it later. 1,750 copies pressed. So as I mentioned, this is a reissue of their first album back in 1999. Uh, Buck Cherry got a few hits off this album. I think there were four of them total. Uh, the song everyone remembers, of course, is Lit Up. That's the album opener. Vinyl variant on this one is Red and Yellow Swirl. Kind of a clear record otherwise. Not bad. Uh, the sound on this one is a little flat. Um, I, I feel like it's too much in the highs. The mids and lows are kind of eh. I could use some more punchiness to it, but it's a great record. Also, the volume is a little bit low. I had to turn it up quite a bit to get this to really get to an acceptable volume level, which I wanted at a very high volume level, by the way. It's a good album. Also comes gatefold jacket style, and uh, you remember the 90s, right? Remember when people looked like that in the late 90s and the early aughts? Yeah, there you go. Anyways, uh, liner notes, credits, uh, produced by Terry Date and Steve Jones. Kind of an interesting combination there, but there you go. I think if a better sounding edition of this record came out, I'd probably upgrade to that and sell this one off, but to have this on vinyl is still pretty cool. It's a great album. I like it. I'm not complaining too much, really. Also released on RSD Black Friday for the U.S., this is Motorhead with On Parole. This is a reissue, an expanded reissue of their fourth album. Originally supposed to be their first album. We'll go through that in a little bit. 
As I mentioned, this was supposed to be Motorhead's first album. It was recorded back in, I think, 75 and 76. Uh, but the label shelved it. I guess maybe they didn't like it or whatever, so they shelved it, and it came out in 1979 instead, after the releases of Bomber and Overkill. Or Overkill and Bomber, take your pick. So this is the only Motorhead album to feature the band's original lineup. Of course, we got Lemmy on bass and vocals. We also have Larry Wallace. He's on guitar, and he shares vocals with Lemmy as well. And then the drummer, Lucas Fox. As I mentioned, this is a two-LP set. Both records are in classic black. Uh, record one comes with the album itself, remastered. The second record is full of bonus tracks, uh, basically alternate versions of the songs from record one. If you've never heard this album, this is definitely early Motorhead. This is before their classic sound in a lot of ways. Um, you can definitely hear some of the Hawkwind leftover stuff with Lemmy. Uh, there's a little bit of psych rock going on. But there's also that sort of old-time rock and roll, which Lemmy loves a great deal. And there's quite a rawness to this record as well, which was probably uh, definitely highly influential on the punk rock scene in Great Britain in the 1970s. It's so no denying that Motorhead had an influence on that sound and that scene at the time. It's there. Speaking of Hawkwind, one of the inner sleeves actually has a whole story kind of on the making of On Parole, but also about Lemmy's transition from Hawkwind to Motorhead, how Motorhead formed. It's a bit of a bio on the band itself. This is done by Lucas Fox. He was the drummer for the band at the time. So it talks about that. Also talks about uh, Phil, Filthy Animal Taylor coming in later as well. So there you go with that. Of course, since it's a two LP set, there's also another inner sleeve. This one has this great pick, Classic Lemmy, and some news clippings from the early days, including Lemmy quitting Hawkwind. Great stuff. Uh, I love these collages of old clips and material and stuff like that. Brings you back, even though in 1970-whatever I was seven, eight, nine years old, doesn't matter. Now, granted, I'm likelier to prefer the classic Motorhead sound to this more often than not, but this is still a fun listen, and this is definitely a period of heavy metal's history, its evolution. I mean, Motorhead is part of that story, even though Lemmy hates to call his music or have his music called heavy metal. It doesn't matter. They're in there. So if you want to hear this record, hear that early, early Motorhead sound, you should check it out. Rounding off the Black Friday releases, this is Anthrax with Soldiers of Metal. It's their EP. Uh, it was a RSD regional release a slash limited run, uh, 1,000 copies pressed. Vinyl for this one is Black in Orange. Uh, this spins at 45 RPMs. And there you go. Uh, interesting story about this record. Uh, the original Soldiers of Metal was released in 1983. It was a 7-inch single. Had Soldiers of Metal on one side and Howling Furies on the other. This was supposed to be a reissue of that single with bonus tracks, but that's not what happened. So I'm going to call it some major BS about this because the Record Store Day description of this record, as well as everyone in the media talking about it, said that this was going to be a reissue of that original 1983 single with bonus tracks. What we got instead was live material from 1986 with Joey Belladonna singing, which is not original Neil Turbin studio recordings. I don't know what happened there at all. I mean, Megaforce Records really needs to respond to this because this is definitely misleading. I mean, this is the cover to the original single. Everyone says it's the original single, but with bonus tracks. But we got this instead. Um, the audio quality is kind of so-so. It's a little bootleggy, to be honest. Um, but I paid $14 for it. I'm not complaining too much. I just feel like I was misled a bit. And I think a lot of other people were, too. Go to Discogs. You'll see it. On the upside, it is live material from a great band. 1986 is a good year for this band. A good period of time for them. Joey Belladonna's in the band. Great voice, great performance in general. The sound quality so so. Oh, the logo, by the way, is uh, is glossy and embossed. I don't know if you can see that, but there you go. Anthrax, Soldiers of Metal, kinda. And those are my record store day vinyl buys of 2020. Now, of course, there were a couple titles that I missed. Uh, the first of which was the Daft Punk Tron Legacy soundtrack. This is a reissue, two LP set on neon blue vinyl. It was a UK only release. Um, I checked the aftermarket. The prices are between $105 and $120 for near mint to mint. Now, will I pay that? Yeah, I might, because that was a pretty good soundtrack. 
The other record, of course, is the soundtrack to Silent Night, Deadly Night. This was a reissue as well. Uh, came out in the U.S. Uh, very few are pressed. Maybe 1,500. Is that few? Whatever. But I missed out on that one, too. I might go after it in the aftermarket if it's cheap enough. Now, did any of you go to the event? Maybe you got some really great titles. Uh, or did you stay home? Were you like, eh, I don't want to deal with the COVID and all that stuff? Let me know that. Let me know if you bought stuff in the aftermarket. Let me know your views on RSD in general. All of that. Bring it on in the comments below. Also, some of you might remember that I did an initial April 2020 video on RSD talking about all the titles and how the event was supposed to go. If you want to watch that, I'm going to link that in the description of this video as well as in the end screens here. So definitely check that out. And in case this is your first video from this channel, I do metal vinyl collecting videos once or twice a week here at the Accusation Network. So if you dig what you're seeing, you should definitely give this video a like, definitely share it with your friends, and of course consider subscribing. That's how you'll find out all the videos that I do, and that would be fantastic. And of course, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.